Elite Expert Insider, the podcast that educates, inspires, and motivates you to take your business and life to the next level. We would like to thank Audible for supporting Elite Expert Insider. Please go to the link bit.ly forward slash Elite Audible. That's bit.ly forward slash Elite Audible. And get a free 30-day trial to show your support. Thank you, Audible. Now to Elite Expert Insider for conversations with industry leaders. Hi, this is Melanie Johnson along with my partner, Jen Foster. Hey, Jen. Hey, how's it going? Awesome. We're so happy for you to join us today. You are going to learn a lot today. If you have want to buy a home, you already own a home, you're looking to sell your home, you're going to learn creative ways how to finance that and structure the deal that maybe it couldn't have happened for you before, but now even with everything that's happened with the mortgage business, there are ways still to get that home of your dreams um, or to help sell your house. Um, we're going to learn how to sell your house not only in a hot market, but in a slow market. We have Nigel uh Way be with us. He has been in the mortgage business for over 15 years and a real estate agent, and he has a whole SEO and marketing background. So he covers all the different bases. I think you're going to learn a lot. So many people um, out there, it really applies to anyone. If you're owning any real estate or wanting to get into the real estate market, this is the show for you today. So Nigel, thank you so much for joining us. We're just pleased as punch to have you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Great. So tell us a little bit about your background. Um, you said you started in the mortgage business. Kind of give people a feel for your background and um, your expertise. Sure. Yeah, I started in, in real estate. I kind of worked my way up. Um, I started in the mortgage business just uh, processing loans. So I learned all the fundamentals of the, the paperwork, the loan programs, all that kind of stuff. I uh, worked into originating loans and um, up until the crash in 2009, I was uh, working a, a lot on purchase loans uh, for veterans, which was a really great experience, especially at that time of year uh, or that time, because there were so many people that were going off to Afghanistan at that point, and they were trying to get their, their home lives situated for their families that were staying behind. So that was really rewarding for me. Um, after that, after the whole thing crashed, I ended up doing marketing consulting for a few uh, large mortgage companies, and I decided to get back into the real estate market myself last year as an agent. So I'm working on building up my, uh, my uh, client list and uh, developing sales and, and uh, hoping to become a broker at some point myself. That's great. Real estate's hot right now in, in Utah. Yeah, it's one of the hottest markets, and, and the thing about it is uh, we've seen about a 15% increase year over year this year, and we still Salt Lake still makes the list of the top 10 affordable markets in the country. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, there are several hot markets right now. I know uh, Florida's gotten hot again. Even the Midwest has started to pick up where that really was a downturn market um, in 2008 to, say, 2012, 13 almost. So give us some insight. Um, the mortgage business has changed so much. It's so hard um, – well, at least from what I understand and from what I hear from my realtor friends, it's really difficult to get that mortgage now compared to what it used to be. It's like you could, they'd almost give it to anybody before and that was part of the problem. So um, nowadays the restrictions are much harder, but give us some input on ways that if you're still feeling like maybe your income is not up to where it needs to be or your credit isn't up to where it needs to be, how can you still structure a deal to get the home or real estate investment property that you want? Well, one of the things that people read about a lot is that you need to have a down payment. And typically to avoid mortgage insurance, it's 20%. But with the rate of appreciation in homes and versus the low interest rate environment for savers, it's one of those things that's virtually impossible uh, to catch up with unless you've got a real high income each month. So there are several programs out there. Uh, the FHA is probably the most common one. Uh, we're looking at a 620 minimum score to get a loan, so not too big of a, a threshold. And when you talk about loan qualifications and how that's changed um, from the past, if you have a job and you can document it and you have a decent credit score, meaning 600 and above, 
there's probably a loan that you can get into. If you're a veteran, you can get into a loan with no down payment at all. And there are other programs depending on the lender. For instance, I work with a lender right now and they have a program called the NHF grant. And how that works is you pay a little bit higher rate. It's an FHA loan and they grant you that three and a half percent down payment that the FHA requires. So when you're talking about out of pocket money to purchase a home under this program, you're talking about having enough money for the earnest money when you find a house. So anywhere between $750 to $1,500 is all you need to get into a home. And depending on how the loan is structured, you can get that money back at closing. So you can literally walk into a home. If you structure the deal so that the seller pays your closing costs, you're going to get your down payment and everything covered. And it's a very competitive interest rate. Yeah, usually the seller does pay the closing costs, at least here, my experience. Let me ask you this. So we talked about the credit rate of just having to be like around 620, which that's, that's great because especially when the downturn, so many people's credit went into the dumper. What right. about the debt um, to income ratio? Is that still a factor? Because you may even have a good credit rating, but your debt to income ratio um, is not covering it. Like they're worried that you're not going to be able to make the payments. Yeah, you know, that's a great question, too. So uh, a lot of people are fearful of being a house poor is the term where you take on this huge house payment and then you don't have money for uh, your car payment or your credit cards or your student loans, all that kind of stuff. So there's two ratios that people look at. And it's easy. It's easy for you to figure out how to do it. Affordable housing is considered about 28 to 30% of your gross income. That's called the bottom ratio. So when you think about how much house you can afford, take your gross income, multiply it by 28%, and that's the payment that you want to have. So then you add in your other debts, and depending on the loan program, you don't want to be higher than about 40%, although with FHA, sometimes they'll go up to 43 45%. VA will do the same thing too. However, VA calculates your, your income, uh, your net income a little bit differently because they take into account um, child care and other expenses that you may have too. Yeah, and those are actually in there for your protection, so you don't get into trouble and lose your house, I imagine. Absolutely, and, and that's one of the things, when people talk about down payments, they think, well, you're going to protect your investment by having a down payment. Really, the way that you protect your investment is by having a lot of reserves or savings. So people will save up that 20% for a down payment, and now all that money's gone because it's into the home and it's very difficult and costly to extract that equity from your home without taking out a loan or selling the asset. So in, in my book and over the years, I feel it's more important to have reserves that you can tap into and access if you have an unexpected car repair or get sick or you know lose a job, something like that. Those are the things that get people off track more than not having a big down payment. A down payment protects the bank. It doesn't protect the buyer. Right. I think that's really important to talk about. I mean, exactly what you just said is, you know, a lot of people will save and save and save so they can buy a house because they can put a down payment on the house. But then they don't have any reserves. They don't have another savings account to dive into for those other needs. And so I think it's really smart what you're saying is to, to still save that money and, and get that reserve, but get a zero down payment house so that you can have that money for if there's something bad that happens or you lose your job or you miss, a, you know, something happens, you get laid off or you get sick for a month or whatever it is. Right. And that's the thing too. There are trade-offs to these low down payment um, loan programs. And the biggest thing is the mortgage insurance that you have to pay each month. Now there's two types of insurances when you buy a house. One is your property and casualty that will protect the lender and you if something happens to the house, like a fire, uh, if you're in a flood zone, there's a different type of insurance for that. But when people hear mortgage insurance, sometimes they think about that, but it's, it's not. 
Mortgage insurance protects the lenders if you default. And there are, there are several programs out there, even for a conforming loan, that only require 5% down. However, the, the monthly mortgage insurance is going to be higher than what it would cost you if you had that full 20% down payment. But it does vary. So the more money that you have to put down is the less your monthly mortgage insurance is. So it, it all depends on your personal financial situation and what kind of assets and, and reserves that you have and what you feel comfortable with. But the point is, there are lots of options for people when they don't really think that there are anymore. Yeah, you almost have to do the math and say, okay, if they're charging me 4% of my money plus the insurance, and then my money is sitting over here at less than 1%, um, you know, how are you going to, you know, what you're paying versus what maybe you can put that money to work in short-term investments that it can make income for you. If it's $20,000 or $50,000, what can you do with that money besides let it sit there and have it generate income? Let's talk about... Um, you're, uh, it's a hot market in Utah, so let's do the upswing first. So um, if you have a house and uh, it's in a great area, but for some reason it's still not selling, what are you doing wrong? There are a number of things that you can be doing wrong. For instance, I, I bought a house here last year, and before I got my license, I worked on enough purchase transactions, and I thought, hey, I'll just represent myself. Well, they didn't, the agents didn't want to talk to me because I was representing myself. And I extended a couple of offers on properties and they wouldn't respond uh, within the deadline. Some of them wouldn't answer the, <laughs> answer the phone for me to even get access to the house in the beginning. And I, I thought about it, especially some of these properties that have been on the market for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks when the, the hottest properties were selling with multiple offers within a day or so. I mean, it was <laughs> literally, you'd see a property and it would be under contract within 24 hours. Wow. So, <laughs> so there's a, a lot of things that you can do. And people get into this mindset, um, the house, that, and I've, I've seen this a number of times, the house I ended up buying fell into this uh, situation. So they got into this mindset that their house was worth a certain amount of money. They got an offer on it, and then that offer fell through. So then it sat, and it sat, and then after about 30 days, they started lowering the price on it, $5,000 every week. And this property that had been out of my price range started to come into my price range, and that's when I noticed it. And I followed it for a few weeks, and it kept dropping and dropping. And then finally I said, you know what, we're at the point where this is probably going to fall into somebody else's price range. <laughs> so I went and looked at it, made an offer on it, factoring in the next price drop that I knew would be coming. So I ended up getting um, a lot of equity in this house because when the original deal was done, that appraisal stuck. Oh. Appraisals attached to a house, especially with FHA. So once an appraisal has been done, that's what the house is, is valued at. So there was a, a lot of room in it for me, which was great. But the sellers could have sold a long time before if they'd been willing to drop their price sooner. But you get stuck in this mindset that your house is worth a certain amount. Somebody was willing to pay for it, and you get stuck there. And the longer a house sits in a hot market, is the less valuable it becomes. And I always thought too, I mean, uh, Houston was very hot for a while too. And I was looking for a home and there was a house like that. It was there for a long time. And to me, it was, it was kind of the location, the back of it backed up to a busier road. And I thought, if this house isn't selling in a hot market, then how's it going to be in a downturn market if you needed to sell the house? So you start thinking those thoughts as well. You know, that is a, a great point too, because in a hot market, when there's not a lot of properties available, then people start considering what I, what I would term marginal property, something that's on a busy street, something that may be really close to a commercial building, um, all these different things. And you think, well, yeah, it will sell now in a hot market, but if you have to sell the house after you buy it and the market isn't so great, how right. long will it take you to sell? And will you be able to sell it then at all? So 
you have to be careful what kind of properties you buy, even in a hot market, even if that's the only thing available. Right. Because when that market shifts, and it will, <laughs> it's not going to no, be worth it. Does. <laughs> right. So you can price that into your offer, or you can uh, keep searching. So there's, there's options, but it's definitely something that you need to consider when you're buying. You just can't buy anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there a way to tell um, and predict the trends for, you know, if your market is going down or up in your city or your state? Sure. Um, the local board of realtors will put out statistics on sales um, every month and every quarter. And so you can see which, and they do it by zip code. Now, sometimes those, those numbers get skewed. If there aren't a lot of homes for sale, they'll get skewed higher or, or lower because one house selling during that time frame will make an impact. But you have to look at the, the broader economic um, outlook of your area. If there are jobs and you have an inflow of people, chances are your property values are going to continue to go up. If you're in, an, in an, an area where you have economic problems, um, layoffs, um, um, like in Houston, where you have one particular industry, um, which is oil, where you have a downturn in oil, then that affects real estate. And you can see it across the country. Um, in Seattle, for instance, Boeing is a huge employer. When, when airlines have problems, then <laughs> jobs tend to go down there. So if, if you're in an area that, has, that isn't dependent on a single industry, that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I noticed um, here in Utah, you know, the inventory was really low for a while. Now it's getting more because a lot of more people, a lot more people are building. But a lot of huge corporations have moved here. Um, Adobe's been here for a while now, but Vivint and um, a bunch of other huge um, tech companies are moving in, and tons of homes are being built. So, absolutely, and. It, Utah right now is, is the startup capital of, of the country in terms of businesses, not only creating new businesses within the state, but also attracting businesses from other areas. And that's particularly true in the tech sector, where the cost of living and owning a business and living in Utah is so much lower than Silicon Valley that a lot of businesses are coming here. And Adobe is a great example. We're, uh, we're looking at getting a, a Facebook uh, data center, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard about that. And I think it's so important what you talk about. You have to look at it globally, nationally. Um, like, if you know, we came out of nowhere for Houston where oil was humming along in the fracking, and then all of a sudden something globally happened overseas that changed that, and then all of a sudden it dried up. So, um, and same with, like you say, in your economy or um, in Detroit with the automotive economy. So I think when you invest or buy a home, you have to always look at the downturn market, look at the worst case scenario, look at buying it. If this goes down 10, 20%, um, am I still going to be okay? Am I still going to be insulated? And am I still going to be able to afford it? Um, if my income stops, will I still be able to afford this? How to structure that? And as that great tip that you said about making sure you have that cushion, um, which is a whole nother conversation of I always teach my sons as they get older make sure you save up like a year's worth of income just in case so you have for a worst case scenario so um, speaking of worst case scenario what do you do to sell your house in those downturn markets well yeah that's a great question too and that's something that we had to deal with in this market um, in 2010 2011 and that's where you have to be better than your competition. And, <laughs> and that means in appearance, in perceived value, and as well as in price. So you're, that's where if you bought in a, in a marginal neighborhood or a marginal property on a busy street, that property is going to be very difficult to sell in a, uh, uh, in a tough time. So uh, pricing is very important, making sure that, uh, that the home presents well. 
declutter if you need to, uh, get rid of stuff, put it in storage if you need to, make it look like a great house. And they say that you make your money in real estate when you buy. And that's really true. If you buy in a good school district, in a good neighborhood, even in a bad market, you're still going to be able to sell. You may not be able to get everything that you want out of it, but you'll be able to sell it. And sometimes that makes all the difference. What do you think in a, um, I think that's great because most people don't declutter their house or get ready for moving. They kind of just leave all the stuff and pictures and everything around and make it clean. And the outside, the landscaping, I think is real important too. What about, uh, and there's, this is a much smaller market, but what about people who just have vacant land? How do you make uh, vacant land seem more attractive? That is uh, very much about the environment around it. So um, there's land is a different property uh, and a completely different scenario. Sometimes you have to hold land for years, sometimes decades before it attracts some value. So uh, there's an example here in, in North Salt Lake of, uh, it's called the Foxboro uh, community. And it was built in an industrial section and it was land that had been held by families that owned car dealerships for decades and decades. And it, let's see, at the, in the middle of the last boom, which was in 2006, they developed that and were able to sell it and um, extract all the value that they had waited several decades <laughs> in order to, to uh, get out of it. So, <laughs> Land is a different story. The other thing is it depends on where the land is. So land up in the mountains, for instance, is going to have a higher potential value because of the seclusion and that sort of thing. But you also have to factor in, is there access to utilities? Is there access to water? So those are, uh, those are things to consider too. There was a, a recent case where the real estate agent got sued because they promised, well, this land that's out here that we're selling you has access to water, but it didn't. And so, um, yeah, that turned into a nightmare. I, she ended up going to jail. So you, you have to be careful about how you represent that land. And it depends on, on what you want it for. Uh, mm -hmm. But as you see this as suburbs spread land that used to not have very much value because it was so far away. Now all of a sudden becomes valuable for, um, uh, for development when before the value lay in being farmland or open space. Let's talk about pricing as a strategy. Um, so many times, like you say, the buyer or the seller thinks their house is worth more. And of course they don't want to start out too low. Um, and leave money on the table. But then if you're so far outside of the market and then your house is sitting there for too many days, so what advice do you give towards trying to figure out the right price for your house to put it right in that pocket? That's a great question. And the best thing that you can do is hire an agent who's experienced in, in uh, determining value. Now, the, the thing about coming up with a value is prices fluctuate dependent on the time of year. So when you look at establishing value, you look at sales that go back for the last 90 days, typically. You're not looking at stuff that went back nine months ago or a year ago because that was a different time. And it, uh, pricing can go up or down significantly in, in that short amount of time. So you're looking at homes that are comparable in terms of when they were built, what the size is, what features they have, number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, garage, location, of course. So you're looking at, <clears throat> you don't want to go out too far, um, not more than a mile, uh, typically. Although sometimes when you're coming up with value on a rural property, you may have to go further out, up to three miles. So you come up with that and you look at not only what's been sold, but what's being sold now. So what's available um, what's under contract and what's sold in the last 90 days. And that's where you can come up with a price because something that sells in February is going to probably be a different price than something that's selling in June. And that home may be the only one that's sold. And so you have to use it as a comp, 
but you factor in what other people are selling for. And so you have to understand what your competition is. Every home has a pool of buyers that's available for it. So the most popular style of home is one that is three bedrooms, two baths, because that fits the biggest pool of buyers. If your home varies from that in any way, like it's got a water feature in it, that may eliminate people with small kids or people that don't want that sort of maintenance. So if, you, if there's anything unique about the property that is going to eliminate a pool of buyers, then you need to factor that into your price as well. So there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea because a good realtor will say before they ask you the price, um, they need to pull all the information and give it to you so you can decide. I've had realtors just say, so what do you want to list your house for? Well, how am I supposed to know? I mean, you're right. I mean, I'm just picking a number. I'm looking at, well, let's see if my neighbor's listed at this and the other neighbor listed at that. So I guess this is the number. Um, so really they're doing a disservice to you unless they are giving you all that information and you collectively with them come up on the, the price for the property. Now, something that people should know about is when you look at alternative energy, solar in particular, that can be an albatross, very much like a pool on a house because sometimes people will, especially a few years ago when solar technology was more expensive, they would buy into a lease for the equipment hoping to, to save money over time on their electric bills, but now they need to sell and they've, they've paid all this extra money to get this solar system and it doesn't translate into value for the house. It's a liability for the house because not only are you buying that house, but now you're stuck with the lease payment on the solar equipment. So not everything that you buy for a house adds value to it. And solar can definitely detract from the pool of available buyers for it. Wow. Yeah, because either you have to sell the lease with the house or you've got to somehow break that lease. Otherwise, you're stuck paying for solar for their house. And not everybody exactly. wants solar. That's exactly. exactly what right. Well, those were some great, great tips. I just want to review real quickly. So for the financing, um, it's kind of how you structure that deal. Um, if you're going to save, I, the biggest takeaway that I got was try and get for no money down if the numbers work for you and use that savings to keep it in the back end, to use it for other things, either to make income with it or for those other expenses that may come up so you don't get in a situation where you could lose your house. I think that's awesome. And then wonderful tips for um, when you're in a hot market and when you're in a not so good market. Keep that house, either way, you gotta keep your house streamlined and looking the best that it can, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's something I think I learned. I have a few friends that um, are working in the staging industry where they will stage your house for you when you're selling it. And that's something I never thought about when I was selling my house. Um, I have renters, which is probably even worse, right? Because you don't even know what it's like, what the renters have furniture's like. So it would have been better to um, stage or hire them to stage the house. It would have sold a lot faster for sure. Yeah, renters complicate the sale of a house because renters have rights, and that does vary state by state. But in Utah, for instance, you have to give uh, the renters 24 hours notice that somebody's going to come wandering into what's their house going through their property mm -hmm. and seeing their stuff. So that is, uh, can definitely be a hindrance. I highly recommend um, waiting until your home is vacant before you list it if, you've, if you're renting it out. However, then you have to deal with having the costs of uh, the carrying costs for the property. So it, it, it's kind of a fine line, but renters definitely complicate the sale of a house. Yeah. Well, and I've heard that, um, you know, when you're selling your house, if you, if you have no furniture at all, sometimes it's better than having furniture. Now tell me your opinion on that. Cause some people say they like to visualize their own stuff. Right. Place. And it, it really depends on, on the person that's coming through your house. I, I tend to look at the, the structure of things, but there are a lot of people who are very heavily influenced by the things that they see that, that are already in there, the furniture, the style, even family photos. 
um, can make them think, well, this is somebody else's house. And when you're a seller, you want them to make <laughs> them think that it's their house and, right. and develop that emotional attachment to it. So when you have a blank slate, people are a whole lot more open to that. And that's why um, when you go to stage a house, you minimize the furniture, you minimize the personal stuff. You, um, I mean, if you have to paint walls that are a really bright color or distinctive color that you have, you paint them neutral colors so that then people can think about them being in their house and not that it's your house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say um, no furniture is better than bad furniture. <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and then if you have yourself, if it, the house is staged, then that's better than no furniture because then well, they can kind of visualize, go, oh, this is awesome. You know, it's beautiful. It's trendy. It's what's new. And so, yeah. So, so I've got to tell you about this condo that I looked at last year because this is, this is absolutely great. Um, in the picture, there was a black wall that had this mural painted on it. And it looked like Superman. So when I go to look at the house, sure enough, it's a mural of Superman, but it's so poorly done. It's not anything that anybody would want to keep. And I thought to myself, why wouldn't you just paint over this? And this was a house that had been on the market for a very long time. The listing agent uh, didn't return my calls for several weeks to even get into it. Yeah, it was that bad. And, uh, and they have this thing. Now, the unit was vacant. And the other thing that it had going for it was right in the middle of the living room was a 12-foot ladder, fully extended, just sitting there. And I just shook my head. <laughs> so, so if you're selling your house in a hot market and it's been on the market for a while, you really need to look at why. You, you need to try calling your agent and see if they pick up. You need to make sure that there's no weird things like the mural or, and you need to make sure that how, how that first impression that a buyer walking in and looking at, at the house, what are they going to think? Because not only is there curb appeal, what does it look like from the outside, but there's that first impression. What do you, what, what do you see when you walk in that front door? You know, that's a great tip from an investment standpoint too, because that there might be that awesome gem that should be selling, but they have the Superman on the wall and they have other stuff that's weird that's easily cosmetically fixed and people can't see past that. So exactly. that's where you walk in and you get that great buy of something that is in a good location that's just badly decorated or um, has some bad stuff going on that's really cosmetic that other people can't see through. So that's a good tip for, uh, for a buyer and an investor. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's where your deals... That's where some of your best deals get made in hot markets. Yeah. So tell us, Nigel, is there anything you want to leave with us? Um, last tip before we close up. Um, I think one thing that, that you touched on and I wanted to get back to it, and that is um, on the reserves. And you talked about, well, you could have other investments. Well, right now, real estate is really the most powerful investment, and that's because you can leverage the value of the house by borrowing the money that you need. When you're talking about an investment that is several hundred thousand dollars, it's going up 10% per year, that's a sizable amount of money. But if you're trying to save money and invest it in a CD that's 1%, and, and you can't borrow that money to put in there at a rate where you can make money, real estate just is one of the, the best things out there now. And you've got a, a stock market that's at uh, near highs practically every day. You're not going to make a lot there. I mean, maybe a few years ago when it was lower, but it's just so hard to make money through different channels besides real estate. And the leverage that you can get by by sucking it up, paying that higher payment for a few years or, you know, not waiting until you have that 20% down payment, you're going to make that up in appreciation in these markets. That's great.
Well, thank you so much for uh, visiting us today. We learned a lot. I hope you guys learned a lot too. Um, make sure you give us a great review and you subscribe to us and catch us next time. Pass us on, share it with your friends. Um, we enjoy doing these podcasts and we want you to share them with others and hope you're learning a lot too. So uh, here's Jen signing off and we're going to say goodbye. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And Nigel, tell us where your website they can go visit to find out more about you and to see your listings. I have a website called swabyrealestate.com and it is connected to the Wasatch Front Multiple Listing Service. So if you are looking for a house, condo, any sort of property in uh, northern Utah, I've got it. And it, I have some additional searches customized on it. So if you're looking for office property, uh, commercial space, I've got that available too. And if there's something you're looking for, like uh, lots or uh, open land, um, just email me and I will create that search for you so that you can customize it and see the most recent and all the data that's available for you, everything that's for sale. That's swabyrealestate.com. That's S-W-A-B-Y, right? S-W-A-B-Y. Yes. We'll post that up. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. That was just ter a great, great content. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody learned a lot. So again, remember to subscribe to us, leave us a review, and share, share, share us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. For more information about us, go to EliteOnlinePublishing.com. To get your free book, The Accomplishment and Success Story Starter, simply text your name and email to 832 572-5285. That's 832-572-5285. We'd also like to thank Audible for supporting Elite Expert Insider. To get your free 30-day trial, please go to bit.ly forward slash Elite Audible. That's bit.ly forward slash Elite Audible. And get your free 30-day trial to show your support. Thank you, Audible.